Good evening. Welcome. I'm so glad to have you all here on behalf of the St. Louis the Ninth Art Society. Again, my name is Joe Bass. I'm the Director of Development and Operations for St. Louis the Ninth. Tonight is a very special night in that we're going to be able to journey through the theology of the Trinity through sacred art. Um, we're so glad to have Blair Pierce with us, one of our society artists. But before we begin, I'd like to call up Father John Brown, our chaplain, to open us in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you watch over us, that everything that we say and that we do and that we intend might be directed to your greater glory, that we might know you through your truth, know you through your charity, and that especially we might know you through your beauty. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So you may be familiar with some of Blair's work, uh, but let's go ahead and introduce her so that she can show us more deeply how to understand the Trinity through sacred art. So Blair Gordy Pieras is a local Catholic artist and is a core artist of the St. Louis the Ninth Art Society. Blair grew up in the beautiful and quaint town of St. Francisville, Louisiana. For high school, she attended St. Joseph's Academy in Baton Rouge, and she was then immersed in the Catholic liberal arts tradition through her undergraduate studies in humanities and Catholic culture at Franciscan University of Steubenville. She studied painting at the Sacred Art School in Florence, Italy, and completed their two-year specialization course. And after returning to the United States, she taught studio art courses, including drawing, painting, and iconography at Franciscan as an artist in residence. She's painted sacred art on commission full-time for the past five years. She's an avid art enthusiast who loves to study art history. She lives in Covington, close to St. Joseph's Abbey, where across the street, her brother is Brother Lazarus. So the whole family is there on River Road. So she's there with her husband, Manny, who's her greatest supporter, and her little apprentice, her son, August. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome Blair Gordy Pierce. So tonight we're going to go through um, how the Trinity came to be depicted throughout church history, starting with the definition of the dogma and then the defeat of the iconoclastic heresy, which paved the way for images first of Jesus and then of the Trinity. We're gonna examine motifs, symbols, and attributes of the different images that we're gonna look at tonight. And we're gonna examine ecumenical, theological, and historical factors that guided them. Tonight, we're gonna look at eight major themes of the Trinity. My hope is at the end that you're gonna be able to see an image of the Trinity and identify it based on these themes. No pressure for you. Um, and then at the very end, I'll go through my personal view of the most fitting representations. So here you can see an image of Jacob wrestling the angel, which I think is really a fitting image for what a sacred artist does. They're grappling with who God is, and it's not an easy task, I'll tell you as a sacred artist myself. And as artists, we should use all of our intellectual strength and creative abilities to represent God in the very best way that we possibly can. I mean, he's, that's the top. You know, this theme is, the subject of God is something that deserves the, the very, very best of what an artist has. So we're gonna look at which ones fell flat and which ones are closer to representing the mystery of God. So first, before there could be images of the Trinity, there first needed to be a dogma of the Trinity established. Before there was a dogma declared at the, the Council of Nicaea, we also see an early belief that is present in the collective consciousness of Christians. You can see this in New Testament writings as well as early church literature, which invoked all three persons of the Trinity. And one example is through the letter of Paul, where he writes, so the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians in the year 57 AD, where he writes, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And the council defined the Trinity as the mystery of a single God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then it was further, of course, there was 
the church fathers writing on it and so much theological development occurring. And then also in the fourth letter in council further elaborated that each of the, of the persons is that supreme re reality, nature, essence, and substance of God. So after the dogma, this leads to um, the ability for artists to start portraying God in, in art. But first, first we had to make it through some, um, some major controversies and um, different theological debates on the topic. So there were four centuries of Christological debates. Um, and these were addressed through many councils, including the uh, Council of Nicaea, Ephesus, Chalcedon, the two councils at Constantinople. And all of these led to an, a theology of the icon and paved, paved the way for artists to be able to interpret Jesus in human form. So there are many theologians that contributed to this work. Um, some of them include St. Cyril, um, St. John Damascene, George of Cyprus, St. Germanus, among many others. And along with the Christological debates, there also arose iconoclasm in the East, um, mainly started by Constantine V, who rejected icons and was emperor. And so you see, of course, most of us are probably familiar with the iconoclastic heresy, the controversy where they were just gutting churches, smashing icons. And um, so there was a lot of theological work that needed to occur in order for the icons to regain um, legitimacy in the church. So we have these great saints to thank for that, which paved the way. The Second Council of Nicaea in 787 restored the veneration of icons, and there was important distinction made between veneration and worship by St. John Damascene, which helped to um, for this to, to come about. The most famous work on this topic is his Defense of Icons, which he wrote in 730 before the council. And by that time, it, there had kind of been a rumination of, of that theology that was able to allow for a restoration of the veneration of icons. There was a second wave of, of iconoclasm, and then that was overthrown by the Empress Theodora who's after her husband died, she restored icon veneration. This event still celebrated in the Eastern Orthodox churches as the Feast of Orthodoxy. And this icon you see here um, is used, often used during that feast to commemorate this major controversy in the church. So I'm just gonna talk kind of quickly. I know it's really heavy in the beginning with setting out some of the history and influences. It's gonna loosen up. Uh, pretty soon after this, we're gonna run through a bunch of images, but just some more groundwork. The Trinitarian images that we're gonna see were influenced by outside, different outside cultures. So some of these include the Babylonian, Egyptian, Greek, Hellenistic, Jewish, Celtic, and other cultures that Christianity entered into. Some of the um, styles, motifs are kind of gleaned from those and Christianized, as it, you might say. They're also shaped by ecumenical councils, early church fathers, um, the liturgy, establishment of certain creeds, devotion and mysticism. And the images gained popularity through the establishment of the votive mass the establishment of the Feast of the Trinity, and they, we saw an increase in namesake churches for the Trinity, and also from in the realm of mysticism through visions of the Trinity. And this helped, this helped to spread the popularity of Trinitarian images, and even just the opportunity for them to be created. If you have a church devoted to the Holy Trinity, you're going to start commissioning Christian artists to portray the theme. This also happened, um, 
sorry, we're jumping ahead a little. This also happened with the um, legalization of Christianity with the Edict of Milan by Constantine. Um, he built a basilica, and so in general for Christian for Catholic images to start being coming more um, in the collective consciousness of Christians, this was very important. The legalization of Christianity. Okay, so as we go through this lecture, I'm including images from both East and West, and I want to talk a little bit about a few key distinctions between the two. So one thing you'll notice is that in images that does include the Father in Eastern iconography, which would technically not be um, considered canonical images, you'll see the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father alone. Most of the seminarians and priests here will know, and theologians, will know that that is because of the filioque distinction. The filioque would be the, the um, addition to the, to the creed, which kind of jump-started the great schism. And so it means that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son in the West, but in the East only from the Father. And so you see that reflected in the icons. The Russian Orthodox Church condemns the images of the Father in the 1667 Synod of Moscow. And that also holds true with Byzantine and Catholic, um, Catholic Eastern Catholic iconography. There is not a tradition of portraying the Father in, in iconography. You will see it though, which can be very confusing but these images would not be considered orthodox. The hospitality of Abraham, like you see here, the three angels, um, which accounts the story in Abraham uh, where God visits Abraham, um, represented as three angels, and he addresses them in the plural. So this is seen as, a pre, as an Old Testament um, revelation of God. This image, is seen as the only true Trinitarian image in the East. You will see God the Father represented with beams of light, which represent uncreated light, however. And then in Eastern iconography, you'll also see, sometimes you'll see an old man, and you'll think that it's God the Father, but in actuality, it is Jesus, depicted as the Ancient of Days. So as seen here, so, the Ancient of Days is what's described, is the, the person of God who is described in Daniel 7. And it reads, an ancient one took his throne, his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. So in the East it is held that this is actually Jesus. And you'll be able to recognize him as Jesus here because of the cruciform halo, and also the initials of his name, of Jesus' name in Greek. So the first and last initials of Jesus and Christ in Greek are always on present on icons of Jesus. Before we get to Trinitarian images specifically, I'm just gonna give a little overview of how each member is represented visually. So there was a development of, of each through time. With images of God the Son, there's different stages. First, we see a youthful beardless Christ, such as in the Good Shepherd imagery in the catacombs first. And then second, we start to see a bearded man of older years, so a grown man. And then thirdly, we see a more mature face with a longer beard, and this becomes the prototype from the fourth century on. And it replaces, so the human representation replaces symbolic representations of Christ, such as the lamb, the lion, the fish, or the good shepherd that are commonly seen in the catacombs. So this is an example of Christ as the good shepherd. This would be an example of him with the longer beard and hair. This is from the mid third century and it's from the catacombs of Calixtus. And also to, re to recognize Christ are the Greek letters, the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and end. 
So then on to early depictions of God the Father. First, he's represented only symbolically or not at all. And this is, of course, because of the theological development and the allowance of images in general, uh, images of Christ first. And then, so he's represented symbolically first. So we see him just as a name with the name of Yahweh, and oftentimes in Hebrew or in Greek, and then also as a throne or beams of light from a cloud or as a hand of blessing. And the hand of blessing was particularly widely used until the 12th century. And then it kind of fell out of use, unfortunately. So I think it's a really fitting representation. And I'll get into that. So he's rarely represented in human form. So then from the 15th century onward, we see God the Father with longer, with a longer beard and hair and older features. This will become uh, more understandable with these slides. So here we see him as um, the hand of, we see the hand of God, the hand of blessing reaching down. This is from St. Clement in Rome. It's a 12th century mosaic. And then another representation of, for a symbolic representation will be the throne of God incorporated in, um, within a Trinit this would be a Trinitarian representation with all members represented symbolically. So you have the dove on top of Holy Scripture, which could both, which are both symbols of the Holy Trinity, I mean of the Holy Spirit, and then the cross of Christ, which symbolically represents Jesus, and then another representation of the hand of blessing. So God is an old man. I'm going to talk about this more in depth at the end, but I just want to give a little, a little basis for it. So the origin, like I said, it started around the 12th century, but then more commonly from the 15th century on in the West. And the reasoning behind it that was used is the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7, and also the idea that we're made in his own image. And then also um, Christ's own words from John 14, 9, that says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. This, led, this verse led to God the Father being represented with the attributes of Christ, which we'll see in this presentation. But then it became interpreted in order to represent him as Father to have older features. Okay, so then God the Holy Spirit would here be in the middle and in this image you're seeing, but then in general, we're gonna see him represented as a dove. In the West, of course, I said, the dove proceeds from the Father and the Son. In the East, there's a single procession. From the 11th century on, it's occasional, but we see the Holy Spirit appearing in human form. And then from the 15th century on, He's sometimes younger than the other two persons, such as he is here, or he has the same appearance. And then when he's represented symbolically, it's going to be as a book, which of course is Holy Scripture, as a torch, as tongues of flame, or as a dove. So here he would be represented as the dove descending. Okay, we are through the most dense part of the presentation, so thank you for sticking with me on that. We can all loosen up a little bit. And now we can just enjoy looking at different examples of the Trinity in art. So we're gonna go through, like I said, eight themes. I have lots of, this is very image heavy. I'm gonna go through and I might just have a few comments about each image, but, um, and a little bit about each theme. So the baptism of, Christ is the first theme that we see emerge. It started in the catacombs, um, usually without God the Father represented. And as we go through, you're gonna see depictions of God the Father change over time as the sensibilities change. Uh, so after the Nicene Council, the Edict of Milan and the defeat of Arianism, we see an increase of Trinitarian images. All of those paved the way so that we can finally have Trinitarian images represented but they are rare um, in the first eight centuries. 
Beginning in the ninth to the 12th, there's a flowering of representations. So you see more creative um, expressions, artistic representations of the Trinity. And then around that time, around the 12th, God the Father's depicted figuratively and the hand of blessing emerges. So this would be the very first known prototype that we have of the Trinity. And of course it doesn't feature God the Father, it does have the Holy Spirit in dove form. It's from the crypt of Lucina and it's from the late second century. This is a bit further on. This is a mosaic from San Marco in Rome. It's dated at around the 12th century. We can recognize the Byzantine format of this image, of this mosaic, and this format remains unchanged to this day. God the Father is depicted as uncreated light, as those blue rays of light you see coming down, and the Holy Spirit you see as a dove. One thing I want to comment on, um, early baptismal imageries almost always depict Christ naked or new converts. In, baptis in baptism, images, images are naked, and this, there was a um, ritual tradition of stripping to become baptized, and this symbolized a new birth as you enter into the world naked, also entering into the church. Um, and then usually you were assisted by uh, members of the same sex to clothe you. So here we see the angels waiting with garments to clothe Christ. This persists in images of the Trinity. And in the East, this image, images like this of the baptism are used for the Theophany feast, which, commemorate, which celebrates the feast of Christ's baptism. And the word Theophany is Greek for showing or manifestation of God. So really it's when God revealed himself as Trinity. Okay, so some more images here. We see God the Father with the attributes of Christ. This is from 17, sorry, 1378. It's from Padua Baptistry by Minabui. And it, it, for me, from what I understand, this must be a, rep, a interpretation of the verse, he who has seen me has seen the Father. This one is by Fra Angelico. It's from the early 1400s, it's in San Marco in Florence. And we see, it's, we don't see God the Father, we see um, a glow of light, which could represent him. And of course, in the, in the scripture, it talks about the heavens opening up and the voice of God descending, which we will see here. We'll take a closer look here. This one is from, uh, Roger van der Weyden from the earlier 1400s. It's a Flemish baptismal scene, and I find it very intriguing, the representation. So you see God the Father, more obscure, but he is figuratively represented. He has, I think this is the first time we're seeing the papal tiara and the scepter. You can see in his hand, sign of royalty and authority, and then he's making the hand of blessing as well. And then we also physically see the words of, of God um, descending here, as well as the Holy Spirit. This one is by Andrea Barocchio, the teacher of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo purportedly painted the angel on the left. This one? It's from 1475, um, it's just lovely. And we see the hands of blessing. We see two hands here, representing God the Father, and the rays of light, and we see the dove descending with rays of light. So this is by a contemporary iconographer, Barbara Bricado, who's a member of SL9. And I think it's a wonderful example of Byzantine representation of the Trinity especially from today. And you can see that this, the format for Byzantine iconography persists in this image. And here you can't really see, but because this is zoomed out, but at the top, it, she has in English, the words of God within this, the, um, call it a nimbus, but I don't think that's the right word at the top. Here, oops, sorry. Oh, sorry, up here, which I think is great. 
and again the angels waiting to flow with Jesus. Okay, the next thing we're going to go through is the visitation of Abraham. Like I said before, this is the Old Testament revelation of the Trinity. Many patristics wrote on this, including Eusebius. I shouldn't do this to myself because of the pronunciations, but St. John Chrysostom, Cyril of Alexandria, Maximus the Confessor, as well as Gregory the Theologian, St. Augustine of Hippo, Athanasius, and Ambrose. Lots of the patristics, most of them. Um, and they connected. So I just, sorry, I want to say like the exegetical tradition, the study of scripture reflects the artistic tradition of representing this theme as emblematic of the revelation of the Trinity. St. Augustine affirms Abraham's understanding of the unity of the Trinity. Like I said before, when he addresses God, he addresses them in the plural. He addresses him in the plural. And here we see Rublev's version. This is the most famous representation, I would hearken to say. It's painted between 1411 and 1425, early 1400s. Um, and it becomes the prototype for this type of representation in the East. We also see this scene represented within the West. I, from everything I can see of different interpretations, it's more as a historical representation than an allegorical one. This is by coming from the studio of Rembrandt in the early 1630s. This one is by Mario, Spanish painter. Um, and it's from 1667. Again, more of a historical representation, but at the same time, um, interpreting the scripture. This one is by Mikhail Nesterov, painted in 1897. This is one of my very favorite artist. He's a Russian artist that I think beautifully mixes realistic figurative art with kind of um, different aspects of iconography as well. <clears throat> this one is by James Tissot, who's a French artist who had a major conversion. Thank you. He had a major conversion and uh, at the end of his life, moved to the Holy Land and painted hundreds of images of the life of Christ. And I think this, um, this theme in particular is a good example of how different cultures and times represent the same theme within their own style, especially the style that's prevalent at, at the time. So on to the third theme the throne of mercy. This appears around the 12th century and is most popular from the 14th to the 16th centuries. It, throne of mercy images visualize John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So we see God the Father offering his crucified son to the contemplation of the viewer and the Holy Spirit either descending or resting upon the cross. Crucifixion scenes and enthronement scenes of God the Father grew in popularity at the same time. And so we see this merging of the two and um, the creation of, of Throne of Mercy images. Here's another example. And like I said before, in, in the early representations of God the Father, you see him represented with the at physical attributes of Christ. And then it, it persists in different traditions. So actually in a lot of Flemish art, this continues past the time it does in, um, in other European regions such as Spain, Italy, France. This is from 1390 by Gaudi. Another with God the Father with the attributes of Christ. Sorry. This is by Tintoretto from, this, from early 1600s. This is the first time I've seen the dove in this position. 
and it could signify when Jesus said he would send his Holy Spirit after his crucifixion and ascension, but I'm not sure. This one's by Botticelli, and it has Mary Magdalene, John the Baptist, and Tobias and the angel at the bottom. One thing I want to just note here is the inclusion of the mandorla formed by the little cherubim, or well, actually seraphim. Here are the six-winged uh, angels, which is one of my favorite uh, pieces of sacred art. This one's by El Greco, and then this one is by Vermeulen in 1550. So by the Baroque age, this theme takes precedence. It is the most popular image of the Trinity at that time. This is a, con this is a contemporary representation by Raul Brazoza, a uh, living Spanish artist, and it was painted in 2020. This is a sketch. We'll see more of his art. So we see this theme is interesting to observe because early Christianity, there's almost no depictions of suffering, of a suffering Christ, which happens again actually in the modern age. A lot of times you'll just see um, an ascended Christ on crucifixes for a period of time. Um, I'm not sure why. And then, so there's this evolving of the theme that leads to a naturalistic depiction by the end of the Gothic Age and into the Renaissance. And finally in the Baroque, which finally embraced naturalism, and so we see very real, very kind of severe images of a suffering Christ. Um, and I think that that's prevalent through this theme. Okay, on to the fourth. Triandric Trinity, three identical men. This one is very interesting, I have to say. So, it started around 15th 16th century, so you have three persons with identical appearance um, at first, and then we start to see some distinctions. Some attributes of each also included that distinguishes them. And from the 15th century, they all have the appearance of Christ. That's usually what you see. So let's look at it. And this theme originated from illuminated manuscripts. In these scenes, you'll often see the triune God seated on one throne. And like in this image, they share one cloak to represent one substance, one God, and no distinction between um, rank or of the persons or anything like that. But I don't think it's very fitting because it doesn't distinguish each person of the Trinity. Here we do see the different attributes. So on your left, you see God the Son with the lamb around his shoulders, hearkening back to those early Good Shepherd images, and of course, Christ as the Lamb of God. In the center, God the, this would be God the Father, holding the scepter and the, the orb or cruciger. Um, and then God, the Holy Spirit, on the right, and there's a very small dove over his heart. This form of representing the Trinity was popularized in Spanish colonies in South and Central America and became very popular. Another example. At first, I didn't think there were any distinguishing features, but then if you look very closely, you'll see the lamb on his lap. There's a sun over his chest, which um, sometimes does symbolically represent God the Father, and then the dove on, his, on the Holy Spirit's shoulder. And then the, the triangular halo is also noteworthy. We have seen it in past images, but when you see that, you know that represents God, especially in Trinity. And, um, Trinitarian form. This is a contemporary representation by Manuel Ferrugia, who is a, an artist living and operating out of Malta. This is very unusual, I have to say. Um, we, this theme putters out on its own. It's never officially condemned. It is 
It is written about and, and talked about as less fitting by Benedict XIV, um, who, who does justify its use using the visitation of the three angels to Abraham. Yeah, this wasn't enough for it to stay in use. It just fluttered out. But yet we see it here, again, kind of resurrected. And the different distinguishing features of God the Son with the cross, God the Father with the scepter, and God the Holy Spirit with the horn of fire torch. Um, okay, on to the next. Three-faced representation. This theme is condemned. Um, it emerges, <laughs> you're not going to see it anymore, or if you do, it's kind of strange. In general, it's strange, right? So uh, here it's hard to see because um, I use this image because this is one of the first times I personally saw it. And, you know, no one went out and smashed every image. So we do sometimes see, see this theme in museums or online, but it is condemned. And this is on the, um, a niche outside of um, or San Michele, which is a church in Florence. It's my favorite church there. And um, by Verrocchio. So a little bit more about it. It was condemned by Benedict XIV in 1745, and there's rarely depictions after the 19th century. Again, um, here we often see kind of a formula for the Trinity. We'll see um, here in Latin, uh, God, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit on each corner. Then on each um, side of the triangle, we'll say it's not, it's not, it's not. And then in the middle, it would say is, and then it would say God. So it's kind of, it's kind of a good visual representation of that part, but the three, headed figure is not. It's really just creepy. <laughs> Another creepy, and the most creepy, with um, six hands also. So we see why it was condemned, right? This is from a 13th century Perugian fresco. Okay, on to the next. So I think this is the fifth. I've kind of lost count. But another theme is the Trinity enthroned, or the Psalter Trinity. This gets its name from Psalm 109. The Lord has said, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool. And illuminated manuscripts gave birth to this theme. It's also seen in Eastern art, but less often. It's popular during the Renaissance and becomes the most popular image of the Trinity in the Baroque period. In early versions, the father and the son have the identical appearances, such as in this image, and then later they are distinguished. And here we see the Holy Spirit proceeding from the mouths of the father and the son. This is an example of the Filioque teaching, and it represents Revelation 22.1 that states that the river of the water of life in heaven is flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb which may be interpreted as the Holy Spirit proceeding from both the Father and the Son. And of course, the beautiful fiery seraphim at the bottom. Okay, so here we see the people of the Trinity distinguished. We see God the Father with the attributes of an old man and the papal tiara, and then God the Son with a crown of thorns and holding a scepter with a cross top it. One thing, another thing interesting about this one is there's the mandorla that's surrounding, um, surrounding the Trinity, and the mandorla represents the meeting of the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, so it's formed by the convergence of two circles, and oftentimes you see it behind holy figures to represent the glory of God. And then also what's interesting, and this one is the tetramorph, so the four evangelists represented on each corner. This is based on the four living creatures in the book of Ezekiel, mentioned in, and also mentioned in Revelation 4-7. Okay. Another image of this theme is, so we see each person is distinguished, the four gospel 
writers around the throne of God as described in scripture, and then also the seraphim creating this areola, this uh, mandorla around them, which is really beautiful. And so the last one of this theme is an image from the 17th century. This theme became the preferred image of the Baroque period and was replicated again and again. And it's, I would say it's the one that we're probably most familiar with today. The next one we'll cover is the coronation of the Virgin with the Trinity. So there's a coupling of themes here. This image is by Manuel Brugia. It's a sketch for a larger painting and I'll show you more of his work later on. So in general with the theme, we see a rise in coronation images around the founding of the Glorious Mysteries. This was in 1569, uh, the 15 Mysteries of the Rosary were established. And that kind of paves the way for these, for these images to emerge and be elaborated on. Here's another lovely image from 1596 from a German painter, Aachen, von Aachen. By the time this theme emerges, anthropomorphic, so God represented with human attributes, is common and accepted, widespread. This is another from an illuminated manuscript. And again, we see this interesting depiction of the Holy Spirit emerging, proceeding from the mouths of the Father and the Son. And this can be interpreted as the holy breath of God um, forming the Holy Spirit, giving way to the Holy Spirit. Another, this is by Raphael, a workshop. Um, it's an assumption, a combination of the Assumption and Coronation of the Virgin, which I think is really interesting. It's from 1505. And here we see God the Father represented just as light. And it's also really common with coronation images to only have either person crowning, as we'll see. So. I'm going to say that the artist intentionally represented him as, a, as light, but that might be inaccurate. This one is by Velasquez from 1641. It's a very famous image of the Coronation of the Virgin. Very lovely. Um, very typical here. I don't, there's nothing too much to comment on. I do, it is unusual the coloring he chose, but of course we know those those colors were the colors using purple and the red were colors of royalty. Um, someone just recently told me that why they were, and this is because it used a certain kind of um, shells to dye, and it was about $8,000 worth per very small um, square inch piece of fabric. So only the royalty wore them. This is a contemporary representation of the coronation by Raul Verzosa, again. Lovely, we see a diverse representation within the angels. Very cute. I shouldn't say that, right? His work is amazing. I'm sure you wouldn't appreciate it if I said, very cute angels. Um, okay, so this is by my teacher, my former teacher, Nacho Valdez. Uh, he depicted God the Father and wanted to, this is requested by the commissioner. Um, there, he, he explained to me that there is a tradition of having God the Father crown Mary, although we do see also just God the Son crowning her. Um, and he wanted to represent him with younger features, older than Jesus, but not an old man. And he wanted him to be strong. So very beautifully, technically, but I'm biased. This one is Rob Rosso's Coronation of the Virgin Mary. This is painted in 2021, so I hope that this restores your faith in the sacred arts in the church. It's really amazing. This is in St. Paul's. I seem to have lost the city here. So on to fatherhood and fraternity images. Yes, now we know that this image would be considered unorthodox in the East. Um, but we do see a lot of these images and it is a one of the themes I want to cover. So fatherhood and fraternity images, these emerge around the 11th to 15th centuries. They're inspired by John's Gospel. 
who is in the bosom of the Father, has revealed him. It disappears on its own, though it's not a result of any ecclesiastical condemnation. So it's based on, the, on another verse as well. No one has ever seen God. It is only God himself who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. Referring to Jesus. Another very early representation. And another. And although I am not... Um, privy to images of God, Father, and Soul Man. This is one of my favorite images, of course, because I love um, Besnetsov, another Russian artist who combines more realistic with iconographic themes. Something that's interesting in this image I want to point out is the eight-pointed halo of God the Father. In iconography, we see this um, representing his glory. It's called the Slava. In his halo, we see the different points representing the seven days of creation as well as the eighth day or the day of eternity. Of course, also, um, God the Father sits upon the rainbow as described in Ezekiel and Revelation, representing the throne of God. And we see this beautiful areola uh, formed by the seraphim. So contemporary representations. We've gone through all the themes now. So we're nearing the end. And I just want to talk a little bit about contemporary representations. These often follow the motifs that have been set before us, so the themes that have been set before us. There aren't too many original representations. Um, at least orthodox ones. I would say there's some that just don't don't line up with the, the dogma of the Trinity. So this one is by Raul Berzoza. We see um, Our Lady of Fatima with a crucified Christ and God the Father. Another by the same artist with the resurrected Christ. I think that this is Ignatius of Loyola. I'm not sure that. This one is by Manuel Brugia from an abs in, the, in Balta. Christ enthroned with God the Father over and the dove proceeding. We see the triangular halo and the initials Alpha and Omega. This one's interesting. We see a symbolic representation of God the Father by the, the triangle with the beams of light radiating and its coronation scene. Also, we see um, Mary and Christ stabbing Satan. Includes a lot. But this one we went through again, but I just want to give it as another example to restore your faith in the sacred arts. This one is with the Holy Family and the Trinity. And there's a tradition of representing the Holy Family as kind of the earthly Trinity. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, about how the Trinity is akin to a marriage. And um, there's certain insights there to, to understanding it. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, okay, to close this out, I'm gonna talk about my personal opinion on which images um, our best. Of course, the church permits certain images. Um, of, so, in the at least in the West, God the Father is it's permitted to have images of him as an old man. But to me, it takes away from the glory of God, detracts from the mystery of God. I, there's justification for it as. Um, the Ancient of Days, or um, representing just the relationship of the Trinity as Father. But God's immaterial, and I don't think it's conducive to the nature of God to represent him materially. Uh, he already did that in the Incarnation.
So a little bit about how marriage is like the Trinity. The relation of the Trinity, of the persons of the Trinity, there's a reciprocal love that brings forth life. And uh, we as children of God can never, you know, really understand the love he has. And I think that this is really true. If you have a child, you know that this is really true. That we pour ourselves out as God poured himself out in sacrificial love for us. And we can receive and give thanks and honor and give honor that's due, but um, we love as a child loves a parent. We love God as a child loves a parent. And we have less capacity to love. Um, but the community of prisons, the most blessed trinity, is always our model. Um, it's the ideal form of love. It is love itself, this union. And it's one that we should model our life and all our relationships on. So um, I also think symbolic representations of God are great. And I just want to go through a few examples. I think um, representing him as he revealed himself or with symbols um, are, is appropriate. Um, I think the hand of blessing is appropriate because it represents him. We can go back. This one, it represents him as pure act. I think columns of fire, light, the triangle, hand of blessing are all more fitting than the human form. This is Gustave Doré's portrayal of the beatific vision from Dante's Divine Comedy, which is so beautiful, right? Just choirs of angels adoring the beatific vision, the face of God. This one is by my former instructor, Anthony Visco. He's a living genius of composition and anatomy and just a really awesome person that I was lucky to study under and call friend and mentor. He represents the footstool of God. This is the scene of the purification of Isaiah, where the angel takes the coal and purifies the tongue of Isaiah. And he's coming down from the throne of God. And this picture doesn't do justice when you see it in person. It's a huge drawing and just sounding. And then the pillar of fire imagery that the way God revealed himself in the Old Testament to the Israelites in the desert, in exile. In Exodus 13, it's said, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Another, you can see the Ark of the Covenant, both of these images below, where you can dwell. This is another by Raul Barzosa. And there's Ezekiel's vision. Then I looked and, be, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself. And a brightness was all around it and radiating out of its mist like the color of amber out of the mist of fire. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. This is the majesty of God represented. This one's by Tissot. We saw him before. And uh, we see Yahweh written in Hebrew to represent the fulfillment of the revelation of the Old Testament God and also um, with all the prophets here holding the scrolls, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. It's a pretty interesting representation. The last image here. Again, the name of Yahweh used with the triangle and reading light more a symbolic representation. Of course, these are kind of standalone pieces. I think it'd be wonderful to see them incorporated in full um, Trinitarian context. That's it, guys. Um, so I hope this presentation gave you an overview of how this topic was tackled throughout the ages of, Catholic, of the Catholic Church. Um, I hope you walk away being more familiar with these different themes, that when you see an image of the Trinity, you can identify it by type. So just a few closing things. Throughout the Catholic visual tradition, there's a tendency to anthropomorphize God or to attribute human features to him. As we struggle to understand God, we try to make him understandable like us. 
But God himself did this already in his incarnation. So we have the image of God in Jesus, and this is sufficient. While some images of God the Father fall short and the glory and awe he's due, these images do tell us about ourselves as humans and about human relationships and how they help us to understand God, particularly using the model of fatherhood, the family, and the perfect communion of persons. So thank you again for being here, for sitting through this, and um, I hope that you learned a lot and enjoyed just you know, the survey of, of Catholic art through the lens of the Trinity. I certainly did. It was a lot of research and I um, bit off more than I could chew, honestly. Yeah, but you know, it's a, it's a question I had myself for a long time. Why is, why is God the Father represented as an old man? What is the justification? How can this be done better? Um, and this gave me an understanding of that. And I hope it, it also gave you that as well. So. Thank you very much for being here. Again, thank you so much to Blair. Just what an exquisite job of being able to take the living tradition of the church and make it visible to us. Um, that word living tradition kind of kept coming back to me again and again as I was watching this unfold and for us to be the inheritors of this, for us to be the beneficiaries of this kind of beauty um, is a great responsibility. And so your presence here is a way that you're continuing this living tradition, receiving from the Lord his beauty so that you can reflect upon it and pray with it. That's the whole goal of why we do things like this. It's the whole goal of St. Louis the Ninth Art Society is to give you material to pray with to come to know the Lord Jesus more deeply, to love him more purely, and then bring him back out into the world. That's the mission of SL9, that I need to throw all water away. That's the second time I knocked that down. It's booby trapped. So again, thank you so much for being here. If you would like to have more events like this, please visit us online at www.sl9art.com. We have a donation portal there. We also have some information on events that are going to be coming up. We're going to try to do this quarterly to continue to feed you um, and to receive feedback from you. So we're so grateful to have you here. Please make sure to go to the back. Uh, Blair has many of her works uh, presented back there for you to be able to enjoy and also for you to be able to purchase. So supporting our artists here. Uh, once again, God bless you. Thank you so much. And let's close in a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Father, we give you thanks for the great gift of our senses, for giving us eyes and ears and mouths and noses, a sense of touch to be able to encounter you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to come to receive you more fully through art. We ask that you would purify our minds, purify our hearts to be able to receive you more deeply, so to bring you back out into the world that is hungry for you. We ask that you would inspire us in prayer and allow images to be more than simply things to be enjoyed, but mysteries to be contemplated. And we ask you would help us to see that in the face of our neighbor as well. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Good night.